thanks Royds. Uh, so yeah, so you've done my introduction for me, so uh, we'll, we'll just jump straight in. So um, just a quick show of hands, who's ever worked for the perfect organisation? What a surprise, no one. <laughs> okay, um, so let me just tell you uh, where this phrase comes from, the art of the possible. So uh, there's a chap called Otto von Bismarck, uh, he was a German fella. Um, we won't uh, dig into him too much because he's got a bit of a checkered past, uh, if I'm honest. But he said this, uh, politics is the art of the possible, uh, the attainable, the art of the next best. So the idea is, look, very rarely are we in a place where we can, uh, we can implement the perfect solution to something. Um, so actually what we need to do is do the maximum that we possibly can do given the constraints um, that we face. Um, so that's really what the art of the possible is all about. So another word that gets kind of thrown about a little bit uh, in agile circles is pragmatism. So pragmatism means thinking or dealing with problems in a practical way rather than by using theory or abstract principles. So sometimes I think in practice what you see is people saying pragmatism um, and really what they really mean is uh, avoiding the difficult conversations or taking the easy path. Um, and to me, the art of the possible puts a slightly different slant on pragmatism. Um, so when I talk about pragmatism, I'm really talking about the art of the possible. What's the maximum that we can, that we can achieve here? And I think that's, to me, that's what pragmatism should be. So uh, I will also tell you a story. Um, I don't know if we've been to the same uh, speaker courses, uh, myself and Tom, uh, but I will also tell you um, a, a story about Project Impossible. So I'm not going to tell you uh, when or where uh, this happened, um, but I what I will tell you is it's a very, very large organisation, um, and so as you would probably expect with large organisations, kind of slow to change, change takes a very long time. Um, and also, uh, we had a, a hard deadline. So sometimes you're given a deadline and... It's a little bit made up, isn't it? But this one, this one was real. This is a real deadline, real consequences. If we didn't deliver, people in this organization would be impacted in a big way. So we had to, we had to deliver something on time. Um, but also, before we put this team together, the organization itself had actually taken a kind of wild guess at how, uh, what the chances were of actually delivering something on time. So even before the team existed, they only thought they had a 10% chance of actually delivering something. Okay, so project impossible. So when we brought, uh, formed the, start forming the team, um, we, were, we were asked to work in a certain way. Okay. So this organization was, was, trying to, was trying out Agile, um, but these are some of the things we were asked to do. So we were asked to implement the specification. Right? So we had a big upfront specification um, that was handed over to us and we were asked to go and implement that. Uh, we were asked to be subject to some stringent governance processes, and we were asked to conform to the strategic uh, architecture. Okay. So some of these might be impediments, I guess, to, uh, to taking an agile approach. Um, there was certainly a risk to that deadline. Um, and the last one, uh, we were asked to do scrum and report the burn downs and the velocity. So we needed to influence all four of these if we were going to be successful. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to them uh, one by one and we'll see what we did. Um, but just to summarize, it was a massive organization, a hard deadline, a 10% chance of succeeding. Hands up if you'd have taken that job. <laughs> just me. Okay, good. Um, so the absolute bedrock of this thing was that we put together a really great team. Uh, and yes, this team had some, some really good uh, experiences, but I think the most important thing this team had was um, the, the attitude that this team brought. There was no ego on the team at all. Everybody was li uh, willing to listen to each other. They were open to trying things, open to ideas. Um, and, and that was the real foundations um, of everything we were able to achieve. Without that, I don't think we would have been successful. So. Tom talked about psychological safety. Uh, I'm going to talk about it too. Um, we knew that uh, in this great big organization, there was no way we were going to make this organization a psychologically safe organization for this team to exist in. Not a realistic um, thing to be able to do in the timescales that we were talking about. However, what we thought we could do is we could create that safety in a bubble. Right? So if we talked about, as a team, the behaviors that we, uh, that, that we wanted, to, wanted to have, um, then perhaps we could create safety for each other. So when we talk, we have conversations within the team, those conversations would be safe. But outside the team, we knew that that was unlikely to be um, a psychologically safe 
conversation. Okay. So uh, one, of the mo one of the ways that we went about building that is we had a team working agreement, very similar to what Tom talked about. Um, but there's two really key things, I think, in that working agreement. One is that we wanted to work based on trust. And the, the phrase that we used was trust by default. Um, so the working assumption was that we all trusted each other within that team. And that saved a lot of time. So what that meant was, uh, if we assumed that we trusted each other, that would mean I don't really need to ask permission if I want to do something that's within the remit of this team. But what I can do is I can just, as long as I signal my what I intend to do to everybody else, I know that everybody else trusts me, and I trust everybody else to tell me if they think there's an issue with that. So we just communicated intent and we went really quickly. The other thing that we all agreed on is that on this team, everybody was equal. So we had a product owner, we had a scrum master, that was me. Uh, we had uh, developers, testers and everything. But what we agreed was that there's no hierarchy on this team. Everybody is equal. Everybody has an equal voice. Okay. Now, yes, we had different roles and responsibilities. So yes, the product owner could ultimately make a call about something if they felt they needed to. But that didn't mean that we weren't all equal and we didn't all have uh, an equal opportunity to, to feed into the conversations that were happening. There was no monopoly on good ideas. Right? Everybody could feed into that. And actually, almost always, as a team, we decided what to do as a kind of participatory thing. So very, very rarely. In fact, I can't think of a, of a single time um, the product owner said, we're going to do this. Okay. It was always a team thing. So. We had this kind of safe space in the team, and I think that was really important for resilience, um, especially for me, because we're gonna go out into this organization, have some difficult conversations, but I always knew I could come back into this safe space and talk to the team, um, and that was really important, I think. So we wanted to go in um, to influence some things around the organization. We came up with this analogy. We wanted to um, generate some goodwill, and we wanted to win some hearts and minds, so we came up with this idea of, of there being a goodwill health bar. All right, so an analogy from a video game. If we're going to go out and have some conversations that uh, we want to influence some people, let's power up our goodwill health bar before we go and do that. Um, so we, we did things like we, we always showed our, how willing we were to deliver this project. We went the extra mile. We did things for people. We just helped around the organization. We just powered up this, this health bar. And then if we went to have a difficult conversation, we knew that this health bar might take a, take a, a hit. And then afterwards, we'd try and build that health bar again. I think that was important to winning some hearts and minds. So, um, yes, we need to change the status quo. Um, but I think before we were able to do that, the first thing we had to do is to respect the status quo. The status quo was there for a reason. People made decisions that, that will have had reason behind them. They were logical at the time. And the people who made those decisions are probably the people you're still talking to now and trying to change them. So if you don't respect those things, um, you're, just, you're gonna upset the people who made those decisions um, and you're not gonna, you know, your goodwill health bar is gonna deplete completely um, and you're not gonna have any influence. Okay. So each of the things that I mentioned before then, um, so implementing the specification. What we were doing is we were building um, a replacement system. So a system that already existed and we needed to replace it. Um, and this big upfront specification was basically every single feature that the old system did. Yeah. Okay. But we thought, well, actually, to have a chance of delivering this thing, we need to think a little bit more like how Google thought when they built Google Docs. Right? So compared to Google Docs to Microsoft Word, what you've got is a much more focused feature set Microsoft Word is much more feature rich, but Google Docs gives you just the features that you really need to do your job. Um, but we had this constraint with the big upfront uh, backlog that we needed to deliver. So what we didn't do, because we were respecting the status quo, we didn't go around saying, we can't deliver a great big backlog, that's not agile. All right. What we did is we got that backlog and we worked it backwards. So we worked it backwards to a series of um, of problems that we needed to solve. So everything linked back from that original spec to kind of a higher level, and these higher level thing became the epics on a, a more of an agile backlog, okay? We put that on a wall, um, and we also had it in an electronic tool, um, and with our stakeholders, we put everything um, that absolutely had to be done before that, that deadline to the left of a line, and some things that actually could wait 
to the right of that line. Okay. But still each of these points had um, this upfront spec that we needed to deliver. So what we did is for each one of these that we were going to deliver, um, we ran kind of a round or two of, uh, of UX, so user research um, and design. Um, and what we, what we found is when we went and talked to users and we, we tried to find what that really focused bit of scope was, that generally um, it was less than that original, uh, original specification. And then we used the data to actually talk to our stakeholders about what was happening. So, okay, we've got this upfront specification, but look what happens when we just deliver the really focused version of this. So this scope line here, so rather than calling that scope, we called it effort, because right? the scope in terms of the problems that we needed to solve was the same, but they actually we could solve those problems in a, in a more simpler way. So the effort came down. When the effort came down, those dates moved to the left, things started looking more achievable, and it turns out our stakeholders absolutely loved that. So we never pushed back really on that, that upfront specification, um, but we just used the data in this, so we had conversations with people, and they started to go along with that idea. So the governance. Um, so there was loads of governance, right? Governance coming out of your ears, there was so much of it. Um, and most of that governance was around if you wanted to actually release something. Well, of course, what we wanted to do as an, uh, as an Agile team is continuous delivery. Uh, but how can you do that when you're in an organization that, that governance is set up around Big Bang releases and, and waterfall? Um, so what we did is we figured out the absolute um, thinnest slice that we could take through the governance and release. And basically what that came down for to is that the critical path really to, to this governance was uh, more security and having a pen test done. So we implemented login, so auth and auth, and the simplest user journey that we had basically um, in this product. And we took that through the governance and we released it. We released it to a really, really small set of users, like a, almost like a soft launch um, to those users. And then each release that we did after that was just a very small, you know, one feature, two feature uh, features in a release. Um, and because we had such a small set of users, it turned out that the threshold for needing to go through all this governance in terms of risk wasn't actually met. So we were able to, to, to do continuous delivery. What did meet the threshold was when we actually um, opened up access to, um, to more users. That did meet the threshold. So we did lots and lots of small releases until the point where we said, right, this is ready now. We can go past this, um, this soft release, release it to more users. Um, but that needed to go through the governance. But because we've been releasing lots and lots of small things um, at a time, when we got to doing that, we weren't actually um, doing a software deployment. Actually, we were just flicking a switch, just flicking a switch to open up access to more people. So again, another really, really low risk thing to do, and we sailed right through the governance. So we were able to do continuous delivery, and we really um, uh, made, a, made the path easier for us to get through this difficult kind of governance picture. Um, so, Conforming to the strategic architecture, this is where that goodwill health bar uh, really came into effect. We needed to influence some senior people to give us some clout to be able to do this. Um, so the problem wasn't really about architecture. The problem was this, Conway's law. So organizations are constrained to produce designs which are copies of their communication structures. Uh, in other words, the, the software and the, the structure of the organization will resemble each other. If you've got a team over here, a team over here, they'll probably build an API to talk to each other, yeah, that, that sort of stuff. Okay. The problem in this particular organization um, was quite severe because the way they'd organized themselves was this. If you imagine just like a three-tiered a three architecture, um, each one of those architectures has, was owned by a different silo. I don't just mean another team. I mean, a completely different directorate in a completely different location. So if you wanted to get something end-to-end -end done, you had two other departments who you had to liaise with. To make it worse, uh, those departments were using Waterfall. Uh, we were using Agile, so we were trying to, trying to build this thing by understanding the needs as we, as we went along. And uh, the folks in these particular parts of the organization wanted a, a big upfront spec before they would implement anything. Um, and the key thing here is that we were just not going to deliver anything on time if we would have followed this pattern. As I said, it's not really a problem about architecture. It was just the way that this organization was structured. 
So uh, what we got permission to do was to go tactical. So we did a tactical solution rather than a strategic solution. Um, and this team uh, was able to build some architecture over here. Um, mm -hmm. And that architecture was what we would get to the date uh, with. And then after the date, we would migrate to the strategic uh, solution. Now you probably all guess what happened. We, we never did the strategic yeah. thing, no. Yeah. Um, so, the last one. Uh, scrum, do scrum and report the burn downs and velocity. Um, so I was kind of talking to the organization and I was talking to the team at the same time. I said to the team, hey guys, how do you want to work? What happens when you ask a software development team how they want to work? We all go, hey Kanban, please. Um, and of course, what happens when you talk to an organization about how they want to work? They go, scrum, please. Um, so we had this kind of situation. When we dug into that, um, the thing that the team were really concerned about with Scrum was how the, um, the kind of UX ways of working would fit into that. And some people on the team had had some bad experiences in the past where um, somebody, another Scrum master, had uh, kind of made the user researchers and the designers kind of take part in the sprint at the same time as the developers, and they had to estimate everything in story points, and so you were trying to add your story points for your design to your story points for delivery, and think that that gave you something that you could estimate with. Um, so they were trying to do that, and that was a really bad experience. So when we talked about doing Scrum, um, they, they didn't want to do that. Um, so said, okay, well, let's look at some patterns that, that might help us with that problem. So we looked at this. Uh, this is called a uh, dual track. Um, it's a pattern um, that uh, Jeff, it's a pattern that Jeff Patton came up with. Uh, <laughs> didn't even know I was going to say that. Um, and uh, so basically the idea is that like, you use your, use your Scrum for delivery, because that's what really good at. Um, for your UX, um, you have something which is a pipe basically going into your delivery. And that doesn't actually go against anything that Scrum says, because Scrum says you need to get your stories ready, and that's in the Scrum guide. Um, so it implies that there is some pipeline which goes into delivery. Yeah. And what we had is we had a single board, so we had the top half of that board with um, UX going across the top of it, and that was just kind of a lightweight process. It resembled Scrum, but it wasn't, um, didn't have the same kind of uh, rigor over things needing to fit um, into sprints and things. Um, and in fact, we started using a completely different cadence for that, that top level. Um, and then the bottom level was um, a Scrum as you would, you would all recognize it. I could probably do a whole talk just, just on that. It took quite a while to get that to work, but in the end it worked uh, really, really nicely. But also, what we did is almost like the opposite of what Tom was talking about. So Tom talked about um, evolving Kanban with Scrum, well, we did the opposite. Yeah, we evolved Scrum with Kanban. Um, so this, this is a kind of facsimile of our board. Um, it's kind of like how you would, a uh, standard way of visualizing a Scrum board. You've got your stories, and then oh, a horizontal with subtasks for that story. Um, so the subtasks have their own flow there, the to-do in prog and, and done, and the whole story moves over uh, when you've done all the subtasks. So. Um, we started applying the core practices of Kanban to Scrum. So the thing is with Kanban is that you start with what you do now. So if you have Scrum and you apply Kanban to it, you've still got Scrum. You're just starting to use some of the practices from Kanban. So we were already doing some visualization, but what we figured out was there's actually there was an invisible cue that we were never really talking about, and that was deployment. So when, um, obviously when we weren't in continuous delivery, that would end up as a massive queue. When we were in continuous delivery, it, once that got up to two, three, maybe four stories, that was a signal that we needed to do uh, a deployment, basically. So limit work in progress, you see we've got the whip limit up there. Uh, so the sprint whip brackets three. Uh, three is the whip limit on this particular board. You might also notice there's a green card uh, underneath there. Um, <clears throat> so what we, what we uh, discovered is that with a whip limit of three, um, every now and again you would have one person uh, who couldn't um, get involved with the three cards that were already in progress. Um, so we said, well, a, a fine thing to do if you're in that situation is do a spike. Uh, pick one of the spikes from the backlog, do that, because that won't add to the, to the testing, uh, the queue in front of testing, basically, which we thought was the bottleneck. So, um, so it was okay to do a spike, it was okay to go over the whip limit, 
and do a spike. Um, manage flow. So it turns out these subtask things that, that get talked about um, in Scrum are really, really powerful, a really powerful way of managing flow. And you can see that just by looking at the board. If you see the little dots that are on the, um, on the subtasks that are in progress, they're avatars. So that's representing somebody who's working on that particular subtask. On that first story there on the horizontal, we've got three people all working on the same story. So we've got the team starting to swarm around that and the subtasks have kind of helped them do that. Now, the subtasks get a little bit of a bad rep because um, you know, they're a bit of a pain in sprint planning to, to put together. Um, but what we came to is they, they, they almost weren't subtasks in the end. What we were doing was they were almost like activity indicators. So we figured out that most of our stories had pretty much the same activities would happen for them. So there was always some front-end development, there was always some back-end development. Um, there was always a, a, a little demo that we wanted to do. So we just kind of almost had this template of, of subtasks that we just kept recreating. It's the same for pretty much every story. Uh, so that saved a lot of time. Making policies explicit is another core practice from Kanban. You see we've got the definition of done um, at the bottom of the done column, so that's really explicit. Um, other things we've got as well, so the whip limit, having information around the board that makes it explicit so everybody understands the rules of the road, if you like, for this particular board. Um, implementing feedback loops. Uh, so we use the subtasks again for that. So we started off with um, three amigos, so the idea that you'd have a little meeting just before you do development. That kind of morphed into pre and post amigos, so a, a, a meeting just before development and a meeting just after development to, um, to, to show the rest of the team. Um, and those just became little subtasks um, on the board. I think one of the things the subtasks really gave us is it stopped us getting into that place that you see on a lot of Kanban boards where it's um, you know, analysis, dev, te uh, test, demo, and actually kind of enforcing a sequence. Everything has to happen in the sequence. But with the subtasks, what we ended up with is all of those things happening at the same time. Um, and it really kind of condensed the activities. And lastly, improve collaboratively and evolve experimentally. So obviously we had the retrospective pro uh, process from Scrum. What we added to that is we started measuring cycle time. We did that really simply just by dotting the cards. So every day we were at a stand up, we put a little dot on the card um, and how many dots we had at the end was the cycle time. Um, so we started to get an understanding of what the average cycle time was. And then if anything was kind of an outlier, that, that might be a signal to have some conversations. And we ended up doing what we called um, a story uh, diagnostic. So it was almost like a mini value stream mapping session for one particular user story that we just delivered um, that had gone over the kind of um, the threshold, if you like, to, to have that conversation. So all of that evolution put together. Um, so I was quite proud of 2.5 days cycle time until Tom came along and said that they got two days. Um, so, hey, there we go. Two and a half days, still not bad, right? Okay. So, from a 10% chance of, of on-time delivery to delivering on time, not only that, for half the amount of money. The main reason we were able to do it for half the amount, amount of money is because we didn't have to build it to the strategic architecture. Um, turns out that having a silo for every layer of your architecture is a phenomenally expensive way to build software. Um, who knew? <laughs> so... Um, so the most important thing, I think, is that whenever we're having these conversations, we were never talking about, we can't do this because it's not our job. We were always talking about the business need um, that was behind what, we, what it is we were wanting to do. And this little Venn diagram comes from uh, one of Henrik Nyberg's uh, videos. It's called um, something about product owners. I've forgotten now. Uh, product ownership in a nutshell. There you go. Um, so if you haven't seen that video, I'd really recommend it. But basically what he does is he, he breaks down the concerns of a team into this, this Venn diagram that says you, your three concerns are building the right thing, so the right product, the right product for the market, building that thing right, so getting it to the right quality, uh, and building it fast enough, so releasing the value in a, in a way in which um, you get your product to market sooner. You can take any, any risk or issue that you have in software development, um, in my experience, throw it at that Venn diagram and it'll stick somewhere. And that gives you the, the starting place for the conversation um, that you need to have. And for us, it was all in that bottom, bottom uh, circle, really, um, in terms of the conversations that we needed to have. And the other thing that was really important, again, was respecting the fact that this is a human system. So, yes, we talk about the system being processes and structures, 
uh, but there's people in that system and you absolutely have to respect those people if you're going to be able to have some constructive conversations about doing things slightly differently. Um, did we really change this organization? Um, so in the short term, we changed it enough to be able to, to do our, our delivery. Um, we also changed it enough for another project which came directly behind us, which had very similar constraints to do exactly the same thing. Um, so we blazed a trail uh, and that team followed us. So we added a huge amount of value. In the long term, well, guess what happened when we finished? Um, the organization went right back to doing things uh, how they'd always done them. Um, but I think what we did do is we've taken some people on a journey, we've given them some experiences, they've seen how things can work, and if they see those same things again, I think they will be, um, they will recognize them from something before that was successful, and I think if enough, um, enough of that sort of thing happens in this organization over a long period of time, we might start to see some, some longer term change. Um, but, I think that was about the maximum that we would have been able to achieve. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much for listening.